Hey, what's up, beautiful people? <laughs> this is me, Azra, and I'm coming in with another beautiful message. I know you're taking care of your minds, your hearts, and your entire being. Um, I wanted to talk about a topic that has been sitting on my heart. And so I needed to talk about this because we don't talk about these things. Um, as y'all can see, probably on my face, I've probably slimmed down. And that's because I'm fasting. Now, I know this is the month of Ramadan for Muslims who are celebrating, uh, who celebrate their faith. And the way I fast, first of all, I need to make that clear. Um, I don't follow one faith in particular, although I did grow up in a Muslim environment. My parents are both, the parents who I grew up with are both Muslims. And so I had the privilege to grow up in a Muslim environment. Therefore, at this particular time in my life, I practice many faith, okay? Faith that are based on equality, justice, love, and spirit, okay? So that's the type of, you know, spirituality I entertain or I maintain, okay? Now, the way I fast is totally different. Um, and, you know... The reason why I fast is because at every change of season, I find it that it's beneficial for the temple of God, which is your body, to purify it. And what it do to the body, you know, it comes with many, many benefits, not just, you know, not just, you know, putting yourself in a situation where you feel more for the un the hungry you have more empathy for the hungry you have more empathy for the people that are really in poverty i understand that but there are many more other benefits of fasting and now because i grew up in islamic faith okay i do want to say out there i know it's going it's going to contradict a lot of people out there you know <laughs> But I'm not one to conform. So I'm always bringing a topic of reflection. When the Prophet Rasul wasallam was instructed for Ramadan, first of all, it was nothing like it is today. Okay. The instructions were that people fast without eating, without drinking for 30 days. There was no sun up to sundown. It was not like it is today. Um, when he was instructed with how, you know, the purpose of purging oneself, purifying oneself, and also understanding the suffering of another in oneself was instructed to the prophet. He went on with these same instructions to the people and the people weren't satisfied. They said they couldn't do it. Okay. And so he, he came back with these instructions and he asked for, you know, I don't know if it's mercy, but it, you know, for negotiations. Okay. <laughs> you know, my Arab people, they love negotiating. So, um, he went back, negotiated the terms. And so he was given other terms like drinking, they can drink, but they can't eat. So they went back again. He went back again with these instructions for 30 days. And people weren't satisfied. They said they couldn't do it. He went back again and renegotiated the terms of the contract. Okay. And so this time, you know, they said it on a 30, still 30 day for a month. Right. According to the moon. Okay. Okay. Y'all, y'all don't want to, y'all don't want to admit it, but y'all follow the moon. So y'all, y'all are based in astrology too. <laughs> the rotation of the moon when the moon is seen and all of that, that is, that is straight astrology there. And 
So he went back and now these new instructions were given as to people needed to fast from the moment the the sun has risen all the way down to the when the sun goes down. After that, they can eat during nighttime and they can drink, right? But there are still other instructions like, you know, you can't consume some things, you know, you can't do anything forbidden, you know, you, you can't even wearing makeup <laughs> like you can't be you can't be superficial at all right so <laughs> so you know all this to say okay the the ramadan that is being celebrated is a watered down version of the actual real ramadan that was supposed to be um overseer overseen by the people now to each his own okay i'm not part of that faith or if i am part of that faith i practice it in my own way i am part of other faith and i practice it in my own way and there is no right or wrong wrong way to practice one's faith you know i respect all faith okay um but i will say this you know um Religion is great. Religion will give you a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. But in order for religion to have you evolve into a higher aspect of yourself, it will require you to experience and to connect to that experience. And that is what religion takes out of the equation. Because once you, once you start connecting to the experience, you connect through the feelings, you connect to the emotions. And most of the time in religions, people are being instructed how they need to live, how they need to entertain themselves, how they need to love. Everything is instructed. So basically, you're not making any room for the human experience, for you to connect to your own experience. And based on what you, what you are experiencing, you tap into your brain to then act with your own better judgment, act with the knowledge without necessarily referring to the book, you see. And that is, that is the great, I want to say that is the greatest limitation in religion is when, you know, we are convincing people to always refer back to the book. But what happens when you've learned enough from the book to actually venture out into the experience? And one thing, okay, and I'm a, I, this is me like speaking my truth. One thing I disagree with in Islam is the fact that if one wants to connect to God, it needs to do it in one specific language. And I know, you know, there are translated versions of the Quran. People now can pray with their heart. They can pray with you know, in French, in English, in all, any other language that they want. But the reason why we say there is magic in one that uses the word, in one that recites, there's a big reason behind it. And in Islam, is no difference. If you want to really tap into the metaphysic of the Quran, you need to learn Arabic. And I don't care what nobody say about that. <laughs> and if we look at a lot of sub-Saharan countries, sub-Saharan African countries, you will find that there is this, this big commerce of sending children over to mosques, to centers, at a very young age so that they are being thought arabic and it's not it's not done by will you know it's the parent forcing it on the children so that they they pick up on the arabic very early on and it's not necessarily the the arabic that one speak 
It's the Arabic that ones learn so that one can recite the Quran. And if you notice or if you know anything about that faith, those that recite or those that are gifted in reciting, they get to um, they get merit, they get recognition, they get a special place in their community as one who knows the Quran, right? And so the, the reason why I disagree with that is because there is no right or wrong way to connect to God. Um, and you don't necessarily need a language to connect to God. You can connect to God in total silence. Um, you see, and so I strongly disagree against all form of commerce of children or things being forced on them that goes against the will. They don't know why they're being beaten down to learn Arabic. They're just being told that they need to learn it, right? And so instead of being brought into the beautiful faith, right? They're being forced in it and they're being beaten down to learn the language. So because I know a little bit about, about psychology and I know a little bit about emotions, it's contradictory when it comes to, you know, forcing upon somebody something and then that person end up liking it and loving it and adoring it and cherish it. I feel like there is a contradictory even in, in one's evolutionary process among that faith because it was not done willingly. It was not done with an open heart. It was not done by, oh, this faith interests me. I will go in it because it interests me. It, it is calling me, you see. And so I kind of, I find, I kind of, I find it kind of heartbreaking to see that in many countries, especially sub-Saharan countries, we see that a lot. We, we see that, you know, children are not, you know, they don't choose their faith. They just, they're thrown in it and they're thrown in it in a, with some form of violence. When they go to these, um, these community centers where they learn on a daily basis Arabic, not only they're, in some countries, they're malnourished, they're not taken care of, they're abused, they're beaten. And so when they return to their parents, they've been, they've been totally groomed and, and um, programmed, right? Because they don't want to deceive their parents. And so when they come back, you know, they're very calm, they're very quiet, but they never will. They never will share their experience of what they had to go through in order to find love in the faith or be recognized for learning Arabic and, and reciting, right? That they, they will never share that experience as to how hurtful it was, how hard it was. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to say that, you know, nobody should experience um, hurdles in their lives. That's not true. Everybody experienced hurdles, okay? Even when I was learning the Quran, I remember being, you know, in, a, in the Western countries, you know, having uh, Shar Bukhari's with their, <laughs> with their hangers, their metal hangers, you know, um, <laughs> whip your feet with it. You know, if you weren't reciting loud enough, if you didn't remember certain words, like this is in the, in the Western world. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Just to think about that. But that was, that was the experience that I remembered. And to me, if I want to connect to God, God is not a, God is not a, I want to say, God is not God is not a punishing God. God will make you learn the lessons. But it will not punish you or force you into connecting with him. He will always be there. 
God will always be there. The Most High well, is always there, right? Whether you want to connect with him or not, he's always there, always available. It's only when you choose to start connecting that it, that it reveals itself. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk about that because you know, um, I feel that it's important that we do talk about these things. And the same can go for another faith, like Christianity, when children are being sent over to the Vatican and then they're being abused sexually. Like, there is no one, there is no one um, religion, right? Or there is no one religious institution that has been um, brought up without some form of exploitation or violence. Because if we look at the history line, if we look at how all these religions kind of gain in popularity, they were all conquering religions. They all had strategies as to how they can gain territory and nobody can say the opposite <laughs> nobody can say the opposite um they all had mandates as to how they were going to um take up the land conquer some land in all three faiths and in other faiths as well but uh, those were the main three where we can see traces of conquest right? Conquering tribes, conquering or going into wars, right? We had um, Christianity wars, right? Uh, the Crusades, right? So all the, these were traces of how religion conquered, right? Conquered in popularity, even though it got, you know, it became divergent, you have different branches, it still was, they were all conquering, right? They were all conquerors. And so to me, when we understand that, we, we come to the realization that, you know, they're a beautiful faith. You know, the, the teachings are all beautiful. But the way in which men decided to spread the word through control and power was deceitful. There, there is no way to, sit, to put it out, right? And so I think it's important, you know, even, you know, us parents today, we want to teach our children about all the faiths that exist, you know? Why be closed up to one faith when we can show our children many faiths? And the one that they are called to, well, they choose for themselves. You see, I, I don't think that um, there is wrong in that. You know, and some people will say, well, yeah, you're confusing your children, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not confusion. It's options, right? Those, some of us weren't given the option of what faith to choose, right? We were beaten down into you know, knowing what you need to know because this is how we do it and this is how you're going to do it, right? But giving options to our children, I don't see any wrong in that, right? What if the child's calling is to go through into a certain faith? At the end of the day, what are you going to do? <laughs> That's the child's decision. The child is going to eventually grow up, make decisions for himself. We can't be eternal parents to children who are in turn going to become parents right? At some point, we have to know how to cut the cord and have them fully embody their sovereignty, their independence, and their autonomy, even if we guide them, because we can only guide them to the best of our abilities, right? Anyways, I know I've I spoken a lot, but I needed to, I needed to um, lay, that, lay that out and uh, the type of fast that I do is one of liquid. And 
there's a lot of benefits in just fasting okay uh if anyone wants to fast the best way i've seen it happen for me is fasting at least three days without food just water or if you can't do it without food you know have light food like fruits and vegetables right so there are many versions of how one fast in in some in some countries or in some cultures you will have water fast juice fast uh tea fast or herbal tea fast some you will have in some faith you will have da daniel's fast where it's based upon uh fruits and vegetables certain ones right with water you will have the the muslim fasts right the islamic fasts and there are many other ways like we don't necessarily need to abide by one certain form of fast for it to be beneficial but in my experience of fasting and I've observed many different form of fasts. Like when I was younger, I used to fast the Muslim way. And as I became, you know, more liberated in my way of, you know, gaining perspective and gaining different forms of just uh, strengthening my spirituality or strengthening my connection to God, I realized that water fast not only... Um, helps you connect to deeper emotions like hunger you know because it's one thing fasting a whole day from sun up to sundown and then eating like a glutton <laughs> right at the end of the day and i feel like you know if if you if you really are into connecting to deeper layers of oneself then you should do it with minimal food for at least 24 to 72 hours and what does that do is that it definitely opens you up to experience hunger like real hunger and when you experience hunger like you know your stomach is growling and you know that for the next 24 48 72 hours you're not eating or you know you're doing a fast like you're really fasting and so that first of all pushes your limit to how you experience hunger that's number one number two when you are confronted with hunger other emotions arise like anger i know right they end in the same way hunger and anger but guess what both of them are related a lot of um eating habits are picked up on a form of i want to say um catering to one's imbalanced emotions some, pe some people will eat when they're anxious. Some people will, will eat when they're feeling sad. They're feeling um, in despair. Some people will, will eat when they are angry. And so what hunger does in your body is that the more you go on without eating or drinking, the more you are confronted with emotions that you wouldn't necessarily deal with. Because you're so used to filling the gap when you feel a certain emotion. So the beauty of it is that when you fast and you fast for a prolonged time without eating is that you are faced with some of the emotions that are not necessarily recognizable because most of the time you are used to masking that emotion with food. But the more you are in that space of hunger, the more you can become curious and the more you're going to be face to face with the actual emotion that you, you would usually mask into food. That can be anxiety. 
That can be shame. That can be uh, despair. That can be sadness. That can be anger. That can be rage. So there are many emotions that are going to be presenting themselves as you are observing a fast without food for over 24 hours. And what does that do is that it helps you understand yourself on a much more deeper level. And so I applaud any type of fast. I applaud it all. And I think it's, it's admirable. Okay. But if one really wants to dig deeper, I suggest you go on a fast without eating for over 24 to 70, 72 hours, if you can do it. And then it's no longer just, it's, it goes deeper. It goes deeper. The, 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 it takes a deeper meaning into the fast. You understand some things about yourself even more. And then when it comes to eating again, you're more grateful you're more grateful for your body. You're more grateful for the food that you're inserting in your body, the type of food that you're going to insert in your body. And you're going to be grateful for the emotion that you have identified while you were going through ang while you were going through hunger. You then can identify that emotion that you would have not identified if you were to, to uh, mask it with food right? And then when you take note of that, next time you are feeling that emotion, instead of going for food to mask it, you can then deal with it with a, with a better alternative because you have faced it while you were going through that period of hunger, real hunger. And real hunger sets in 24 hours in the body. It starts setting in 24 hours. Even, I want to say, biologically, um, I know that, it, you know, if you research on um, fasting, your I think there is some form of um, mechanism that kicks in where you are in deficit of food, right? or you are glucose deficit or something like that. So your body starts balancing out itself. Your body starts regenerating cellular structures that were maybe dysfunctional or that was, you know. So there are regenerative purposes to one that fasts without food because then your body goes into a form of not survival, but it starts working in the reverse. You see, we are constantly being injected with food on a daily. So our body is constantly doing what? Digesting. It's take, taking a lot of time in our day to digest the food, digesting the food. We're always constantly putting something in our mouth. It's digesting a food, digesting the food. When you go over a period of 24 hours without having any food in your body, your body's like, whoa, what's going on? There's no food coming in. Oh, okay, there's water. Okay, there's no food coming in. What does it do? It's It goes into the reverse. Now it, it gives more time to different functions of your body to maybe clean out the intestines, to maybe clean out certain parts of the liver, to maybe clean out the blood if you give it water and if you take herbal teas. And so that is a science, okay? Go go research it for yourself. You'll find out there's actual science behind this as to how the body functions. So we we have instilled, we have trained our body to always process foods. But when we go in a full 24-hour fast and beyond, beyond 20, 24 hours and beyond of a fast, we can then start seeing our body um, functioning in the reverse, now taking its focus elsewhere where, you know, it wouldn't normally take its focus because it is so focused so much so on digesting the food. 
And so when you put water into it, right? Well, now you're helping your body getting rid of more toxins. You're helping your body into liberating these blockages in your intestines. And then if you know anything about herbal science and herbal remedies, then you can actually, you know, like push it a little further so that your body cleans, cleanses its liver, your body, you know, cleanses its blood, your body regenerates its cellular structures. Like it can do wonders, but it takes great courage and bravery to actually observe a fast of 24 hours without food and over 24 hours, you see? So um, I wanted to talk about that because it is a great thing to fast, okay? I'm not, a, I'm not against fasting. Um, I, I am, I do disagree though for children. You know, children who are not in the age of their full autonomy or their full biological um, capacity, I feel that it's, it's not necessary for them to fast. So I know that, you know, they want to do like us parents and they want, to, they want to observe a fast as well. But if they... To me, if they're not of age, meaning, you know, if their their body is still needing to grow, if they are in their, you know, in their phase of hormonal ingrowth or they are going through their puberty times, I don't feel like they need to fast. I feel like, you know, they need to be of age where, you know, they're, they, they're not observing any growth so that you know they can really pick up on the benefit of fasting. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. I think I did I did mention what I had to mention and I did share what I wanted to share. So um, happy fasting or happy Ramadan to all of you who are um, observing a fast. Um, may it be one of great courage, great reveal for you, great revelations for you, and yeah. I'm um, sending you a lot, a lot of love. Peace.